Welcome everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure. I'm glad that you could all make it. This is uh, in the Data Science Institute Data for Good Talks series, and we're extremely fortunate to have Shirley Ho with us today. I was talking to Alexis actually, and we I wasn't aware of this, Shirley, but they, they've been trying to get you into this uh, talk session for, for a while now, but we finally managed to do it, so that's really great. Um, Shirley is a really amazing, talented um, statistician and uh, machine learning person, which is upper pro for this audience, but she's also a cosmologist and astronomer, actually. Uh, not sure how you would kind of identify yourself in that regard, Shirley, but um, her, her research is really to apply novel statistical and machine learning methods to extract uh, information from um, astronomical data. Uh, so, and she has a lofty goal, actually. Her, her research goal is to understand the beginning, the middle, and the end of the universe. I, I took that, from, well, I, I paraphrased it, Shirley, but I took that from your website. So yeah, no, she doesn't, uh, she's not worried to take on big problems. But um, she's been taking a very kind of um, uh, different view than, than in the past by applying machine learning in, in very, very creative ways. And I've been following her research for a while. We first met uh, a few years ago when I was at a um, quantum computing, uh, not a quantum computing, but a um, quantum physics a CCQ um, set, uh, workshop at the Flatiron. So, that brings me to her position. So she's actually a member of the Flatiron Institute. She's just downtown, so they're actually very close. She's actually group leader of Cosmology X Data Science. Is that how you say it? I'm not sure what that X is. Um, in the Center for Computational Astrophysics. Um, her background, uh, her PhD was in astronomy from Princeton in 2008. And then she uh, had a number of named uh, postdoc fellowships in, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab before becoming assistant professor at CMU at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, she was there, the Cooper Siegel Career Development Chair. Um, uh, she uh, got tenure there, but then she actually switched back, I think, temporarily to Berkeley and before going to Flatiron. So she's um, been moving around. Um, she's already won a number of awards. She's a NASA Group Achievement Award and uh, Macronics Prize. Uh, she's also a fellow of the International Astrophysics Association. And uh, all of this had actually uh, a very early, early career to be having so many awards. So I think the community is recognizing what I recognize that, uh, that she's a great talent and we're very fortunate uh, to have her here. And uh, her Twitter handle is Cosmo Shirley, right? <laughs> so I guess that's how you self-identify, Cosmo. So with that, let me hand over to Shirley. It's a really great pleasure to have you here and uh, I can't wait for your talk. Thank you so much, Simon. That's a wonderful presentation and uh, introduction of me and I can't do it better at all. And I would love to come visit Colombia in person sometime soon. I think I did it right before the pandemic. And, um, and I think Jeanette showed me around DSI. It was really great to see all these like, connections among different departments and all this vision that you know, she has. And I think you're gonna have a lot of you know, development in that direction too. I'm super excited to give this talk today. And um, I'm kind of hoping that it will be a two-way conversation along the way if people like to ask questions and suggest comments because it's a very rapidly changing field that I'm in. And I'm always finding something new from the audience that I never heard of. So I'm, this is like an educational experience for me, learning from the audience. So hopefully we'll feel free to ask questions as much as you want. Um, and Simon will help me. Thank you so much for dealing with the questions and bring them up and unmuting them if you can. Um, I'll share a screen now and hopefully I'll do it in person sometimes. Um, and Simon, when you come back, we'll definitely need to chat. Awesome. I hope everyone sees the screen now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'll be talking about from the planets to the universe, how deep learning changes science one small step at a time. And I'm doing it like a slightly biased version of it because for me, science is a little bit more astrophysics ish into, you know, in my broad, very narrow experience, I shouldn't say broad. Um, as Simon talked about, 
I am currently at Flying Institute as a group leader at the cosmology. The X is cross data science, but honestly, I do both, I would say. Um, I have some kind of joint appointment at NYU and Princeton where I can advise students and supervise students. Um, I'm showing work with students actually a lot and postdocs um, today. A lot of them are carried out by postdoc students and collaborators that I have around, you know, the New York area. Um, most likely you will heard of, you might have heard of Miles Kramer from Princeton, who's a grad student at Princeton. He's a fourth year now. And Kim Ryusu, who's actually just graduated from Princeton, went to Google. Uh, Kimberly Stetchenfield from DeepMind, Pavel Lemos, who's at University of Sussex, who's going to move to Mila and CC, like a joint postdoc position. CC is where I'm at the Flying Institute, Center for Computational Astrophysics. Now, Jeffrey is at ENS uh, at Colin Normal Supreme, and Elenko was at Flatiron Research Assistant, uh, Drummond Fielding, a Flatiron um, Research Fellow here, who's, uh, I think, I think of them as a uh, prize fellowship. Uh, CEO Hei was one of my students who graduated, went to Weimar. Um, Ying Li, who's at Flatiron, who's going to become a researcher also very soon, and Simon Reffenbash, who's currently a professor at Miller, but he did a bunch of work with us when he was a postdoc at CMU with us. Um, Peter Bataglia, DeepMind, very close collaborator in the network world, so is Alvaro Sanchez. Also, we work with Kyle Kramer and Ives Spurgle, um, who's right now the um, Simon's Foundation president, actually. So. Without further ado, let me just show me some, so some pictures of the students and the postdocs. Um, you probably will see some of the names showing up very soon at the presentation coming up. All the works mostly by them, all the complaints you can come to me. So that's how I describe it. <laughs> so what science, top, science topics we will touch on today, I'll talk about, you know, for example, predicting what happened next or regression to a particular quantity that happens very often. We also want to understand the underlying rules of a system that we observe. It doesn't have to be science necessarily, but you want to understand rules or relationship between objects in a data set. We also sometimes want to find missing components or basically regress to understand what the missing component should be. So that happens not just in science, very often in all kinds of data sets, but it happens a lot with us. And I'm showing some of the results that um, we have shown recently to be very useful um, to use deep learning to accelerate um, either the predictions or simulations or how do you do much better. So here are some experiments I'd like to show quickly. Um, uh, these are simulated experiments. What happened is that all of them actually are shown in different papers where they use graph network to model the system. Um, I will talk about what graph network is. It's just a type of neural network. Um, with a stronger inductive bias, which I also mentioned what that means, but more like a physical prior to describe the system. Um, these experiments are run and then were washed, or you can say was fed into a neural network. The neural network would basically predict what happened next and whether, say, whether it will fall, which direction it will fall. And it can also do the prediction what happened next with different masses much more complex scenes and how to infer masses and stuff like that. Let me just show you a few of these animation. Um, this one, we basically compare what the neural network has done in graph network actually, and how it compares to what humans can do. And it turns out they're actually both really doing really well in terms of how well to predict whether a certain set of blocks will fall. Which directions they will fall can also make very good predictions of, you know, even when we have different masses, that, you know, they're very different masses. And very complex scenes, these are actually a lot of work coming out from um, Peter Vitaglia's group from Graph Network, uh, the structure learning group in DeepMind. And you can see here, when you hit the fours here, it's asking basically how many red blocks or yellow blocks is gonna fall off, where they can make that prediction. And you infer the masses of these blocks if you didn't know about the masses of the blocks. And you actually can do that. And this is something that we actually later on apply to one of our analysis with real data, which I'll show you later. And here is predicting how much fluid are there on each side, given the complexity of like these blocks, you can change them. So all these experiments are something that scientists have seen and actually normal people every day have seen and made this inference of what happened next. And a little bit more complex you know, astrophysics clear to heart, the applications that we've used 
uh, deep learning to accelerate. We also want to show a little bit of those work we've done. So Simon at Reference Bash, when he was a postdoc at CMU, he worked with us, and he was one of the first, I believe, probably one of the first application of a uh, convolution neural net. At that time, we actually have to create our own 3D convolution neural net. You'll be like, whoa, that's crazy. Um, we went from basically huge simulation boxes of the universe that we can simulate and try to predict these latent cosmological parameters. And it is a huge industry in our world to predict and understand what is contained in the universe. And our traditional technique is actually this red dots that you can see here, well predicted and versus ground truth, we want to be basically on the black line, predicting how much dark matter that is in the universe. For those who haven't heard of dark matter, it's about 30-ish percent of the universe is contained, is uh, composed of these dark matter components, where CERN is looking for it, it's a huge accelerator, and we don't exactly know what it is. Um, and what we know, and you know, we can touch every day something called baryons, which only contains about 5% of the universe. So we're trying to figure out what these like other chunk of matter there is. And also sigma eight is basically describing how things, you know, clump together or cluster together. And you can see that the red dots are doing super, not very well, given the same amount of data. While our very simple convolution unit, this is back in 2016, which is eons ago when you think about it, in uh, deep learning speak, um, they actually do much better. So we thought there must be a lot more information that the 3D ConfNet was able to pull out compared to our bread and butter analysis that, you know, the power spectrum analysis was basically what I got tenure for, right? To understand the fundamentals of the universe using our traditional techniques. And so we surely, ran on a, yes. I mean, you're using a convolutional neural net and you're doing regression, right? So you, and you've got a ground truth, but is the ground truth, what's the ground truth coming from? It's coming from the simulation. From the simulation. This is all from simulation. Okay. This is like the first, I think probably one of the first papers we've written or anyone has written at that point on like using deep learning on doing anything in cosmology. And, and how do you know the simulations are any good? Oh yeah, the simulations Compared are- Compared to the- with, Compared to which one size? Compared to the real the, universe? The real universe, yeah. Very good question. So this became like a huge research direction for multiple groups, actually. This particular simulation is not representative of the real universe because it only contains dark matter. It does not mm -hmm. contain all the baryons, the stuff that we know and love, like stuff made out of, made of us, basically the stardust. And with including all that in hydrodynamics will be what we actually need. And then passing it through something like a telescope, you know, like a similar telescope to get to the point that we would observe, that's actually what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole program my group actually yeah. are going, which I'm not talking about today on simulation-based inference on the universe itself to figure out what happened at the beginning of the universe and the contents of the universe. By simulating forward the entire universe, with accelerated techniques using deep learning techniques because usual simulations would take about 300 million CPU hours to generate a tiny, tiny chunk of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's just not possible to scale. And when you'd want to do inference on these high dimension parameters. And there's a lot of work that we haven't even figured out how to do, for example, doing inference in high dimension. How do we do that and getting posterior? So that's Actually, some of the work, um, one of the postdocs here, Sharak Modik, is working with David Bly at Columbia on figuring out how to do this inference, um, who's actually, I think, David Bly is part of DSI as well. Um, so there's a lot we can talk about today, but this is one of the things we've done very early on. We realized, all we realized is that there is extra information that we should pull out using convolution neural net, very simple stuff back then. And that just hinted at a bunch of things we should do afterwards. Okay, and got it. another thing, yeah, another thing we did is that this is part of the simulation-based inference steps that we have to take, which is to accelerate these cosmological simulation to make it a million times faster or something like this. So we also did something very simple, um, simple in retrospect. It's just running a unit to go from a pen and paper prediction of the universe, what it looks like right now, to the true simulation output for just dark matter simulation in this case. On the left, we're showing 
you know, a simulation of the universe. And this simulation took 300 million CPU hours to run. And it's a tiny, tiny chunk of the universe. So we can't do that, right? And so can we do it in seconds? So that's what we actually tried to push. And we succeeded at least in some of these chunks. So we succeeded in the dark matter simulations. We're able to make it a million times faster. So on the right hand side shows the error plot showing you how the unit, which is a very simple deployment of what people have been using in a segmentation, actually medical research back then. Um, and showing the unit actually does a lot better than the benchmark at that point where everyone were using to make fast simulations by about a factor of 10 without much tuning. And what's surprising about this paper, why it was a PNAS paper was that it generalizes outside of our training sets quite a bit. And this is something we're still trying to figure out why. And there's a couple of paper, there are a couple of papers that are coming out that will discuss this further and generalizing it to different cosmological parameters that it wasn't trained on, these latent parameters it wasn't trained on. Say we ran it with different, with this one single amount of dark matter, but it was able to generalize to different amounts of dark matter in the universe, significantly different. I mentioned earlier that it says about 30% of the universe is dark matter. The code that was trained on only 30% dark matter was able to, of the simulations, were able to generalize to beyond 30% dark matter. It went to 10% and 50%, it still works. So we were very puzzled. So we tried to figure out what happened. So that's another story, but we can talk about it later. Um, but this actually brings back to an um, interesting point, which We've been seeing this dramatic adoption of deep learning techniques in astrophysics in the past few years, which I'm very happy to see. But when we use these techniques, a lot of people describe them as black boxes. One of my collaborators used the word magic the other day. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, we've seen a lot of pushbacks against them at the same time. So because at some level we accumulate these technical debts, whenever we use a technique that's not one understood at least by someone, right? It's not like I can build a car before I can drive a car, but someone knew exactly how a car worked. So we haven't got to the point that we understood exactly why this neural network would generalize outside the training set, for example, we talked about earlier. So what should we do with this technical debts that we accumulate? And I, in this talk, I would like to talk about how to approach or try to make an approach of uh, interpretable machine learning to the rescue. And trying to figure out what we can do with that. So we have a data set. We usually use a neural network to make sense of the data. I think of it myself as some kind of dimensionality reduction. I know it sounds less sexy than like AI or machine learning or deep learning, but in the end, it really just at some level condensed to things that make sense to the neural network that it makes the correct prediction next or makes the correct regression next, right? And then how do we maybe possibly extract First of all, you probably want to make the neural network a lot simpler in some ways. And then I want to extract to some equation or relationship that is symbolic that we humans can understand. So that's what I'm hoping to do to create a um, sort of structure to understand the data set. But at the same time, that structure will be regularized or I should say reduced in dimension that it can be understood in some ways. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the later part of the talk. So I'm just pausing right now in case people have questions about this. That's sort of the idea, but I'll go into the details later on with some examples and what we have done so far. It's not complete yet because if it's complete, I hope I'll be famous, uh, but it's not yet there. <laughs> Any questions? I'll keep going a little bit. All right. So let's try with planetary simulations and see what we whether, you know, this is the data set we're going to show, right, to some neural network. So time t equals zero, some planets moved around, t equals two, time t equals t1, it basically moved the next step. So can we predict what happened? Usually, you know, what happened usually and traditionally is that. This is actually the Isaac Newton apple tree, apparently, in his manner. If you have a very rich person who gets served food all the time, I guess, who has all the time to think about science, and it happens the apple hits your head, and somehow, I guess, all these things connected, we'll be able to figure out some 
laws of physics or relationships around these planets, you know, looking around, thinking about all this. We observe these planets moving around the stars. Can we figure out the physical law that governs the motion of the planets? It can either work super hard and be super lucky and probably rich and came up with it, right? In this case, like Newton and Gus, I think super lucky is very important in this case too. Or we can do something a little bit, I guess, uh, layman friendly. Um, we call we use symbolic regression or like genetic programming, evolutionary programming. There's a huge literature behind it, which I'm not going to go into. There is a large number of uh, methods to do this, but we're going to concentrate on one particular one that we end up using. And I'll talk about this a little bit called symbolic regression. What is symbolic regression? We can Shirley, before you go on, before you go on, there's actually yeah. a question uh, from hey. Louis Philippe. Uh, Bellier says, how small is a piece of universe that you're talking about trying to predict? And then it says movement. I'm not sure I understand that. So uh, Louis-Philippe, jump in if I, if you want to elaborate. But yeah, how small is the piece of universe you're talking about trying to predict? Yeah, so so the we actually want to predict everything we can observe by the telescope. So it's actually a huge chunk of the universe. We're thinking that we're talking about a quarter of the universe up till about six billion years ago. So it's a, the universe is about 13 billion years old. So I guess an eighth of the universe. Um, that's not a small piece. The 300 million CPU hours quote that I had quoted is probably about a hundredth of that that I just mentioned just now. So one eight hundredth of the universe, I guess, that how we, we look at for that 300 million CPU hours. and and you say, okay, we can just you know brute force it and run eight hundred times, but the problem is, it's not just run eight hundred times for the the same for the one universe, right? You have to predict it for different theoretical models of how much dark matter there is, how much baryons. That baryons are like the stuff that make us you know make us whole. You know all the stuff that we're thinking about. Yeah, three million CPU hours exactly. That was for one tiny bit of the universe with hydrodynamics of the baryons and the dark matter all running together. And that's just one tiny, tiny piece, but you have to do it many, many times because of different astrophysical models and physical model of the universe that people don't know about. How much dark matter there is, how does explosion of star interact with the surrounding media? And how does that affect the planet formation that makes us here? So there's all these connections that we have to make and they're not actually so trivial. And um, sorry, what are the effects of the dynamic nature of the universe on your there was a There was a corollary on the previous one. Is, is it 300 million CPU hours or 3 million CPU hours for the 1 800th of the universe? 300 million CPU hours 300. for 1 800th yeah. of the universe for one single universe parameter. Okay, <laughs> yeah. And that's a kind of steady state universe, like you said. It, do, it doesn't have like, um, rare events like supernovae or something is that it right? does have it does have supernovae oh it does okay yeah it will have dynamic stuff like happening all the time so like the movie i showed earlier would actually you will see a supernova explode actually multiple supernova explode if i, show I it, go back right. and i'll show it later it's okay. cool yeah and right. um, these are dynamics so things are all moving around constantly as um, i think Ilka was saying Correct. okay yeah cool so yeah, that, that's crazy universe to assimilate, of course. Um, yeah, no but kidding. what we're yeah. gonna go to a smaller chunk of the universe here, just the planetary systems right now. And I wanna go back to symbolic regression a little bit, which is something as a concept I wanna describe here or technique, where you have a bunch of mathematical functions and variables, and you can form new equations as you see fit. And right now the algorithm actually doesn't pick very smartly. You can probably pick smartly how you will form the next equation. We check whether the new equation fits the observables, you know, it makes the predictions and whether it fits the observables. And then we move on to the next new equation to find better fit. The possible issue here for symbolic regression is that it's a large search tree, it's a large search space for all the mathematical functions and variables you can put together like sines and cosines, exponentials, you know, all that. So how do I use such a, an inefficient search of the equation to interpret a large neural network, right? So that sounds very difficult. But what we are actually gonna do here is not use such a large neural network. We're gonna use a graph neural network 
which have a strong inductive bias, which really means a physical pie about what the system is about, right? So we have a bunch of planets moving around. I'm gonna use something called graph neural network, which looks, you'll see very soon, looks like perfect fit to model these planets. And once you model it to predict the dynamics first, it sort of condense this information into this neural network. And I'll explain how we extract the equation after that. So here's the paper um, led by Miles Kramer in um, 2020. And we had looked at a bunch of particles. We want to use the graph network to predict dynamics. And while training, we want to encourage low dimensionality representation in this network. And once you were able to basically do like an L1 regularization, if I use ML speak, then you can extract the equation. So that's sort of the program for the next probably 10 minutes or so. So let's concentrate on predicting dynamics first. And neural network's great, right? So you model it, took a look at all the data sets, makes predictions, compare update weights. And that's the graph network. I just want to quickly explain it's an interaction network. It's not a graph convolution neural network, which a lot of people tend to use for like, uh, traditionally, I don't know why. Um, it is better and has a lot more flexibility. Um, a graph is a natural way to represent entities and the relationship. So you have these nodes, V1, V2, V3. You have these edges, which could be directional or unidirectional. The edges can respond, correspond to the relations, interactions, or transitions. You can infer about entities and relations respecting the graphical structure. Um, and it captures many complex objects in relation systems, right? So molecules, mass spring systems, the n body system is a fully connected graph that you've been seeing actually. The rigid body system, like the wall with these things moving around in the middle, we're assuming the wall doesn't move. So you can see that it's unidirectional edges pointing out. Can you even represent sentence and parse trees or a fully connected scene graph? Um, early COVID times, I was so, I guess everyone was affected by COVID in different ways. I was affected by it and then I went, not physically, but more mentally, and I said, oh, why don't I just model like the COVID rates in different like cities by looking at these relationships. So you can also model COVID situation with the graph net. It turns out that the data early on was very messy. It was very difficult to train. Um, here is how things actually work. We can go a little bit deep dive into this just to get a sense of how this work. Um, for the n-body systems, for example, you have this fully connected graph. You have these nodes, these Bs here. There is a global variable that you can utilize. We did not actually utilize, but you can think of it as the total number of people in a party. If you want to think of the nodes as people, or the total number of planets, the total energy, the total angular momentum, the potential, of the system like it's whatever you want to put in and the edge function here compute the messages from the nodes and the edge attributes so you can decide what the edge attribute is and a lot of times these edge attributes are unknown and it could be like weights that you update as it goes and then you also have the node function that update the node info which takes in all the edge messages and say, okay, taking all the edge messages and what I have from previously, like my node states from before and the global variable U, I can compute what happened next. And you train it to predict the node states from T0 to T1. So that's sort of like a little bit in depth dive of what this interaction network we have been using actually many of our work um, works. So we did that. We take a bunch of planet simulations for each do you, pair of planets, Shirley, an edge. Do, yeah. you, do you retain all times when you do that update? So you're doing like a deep neural net, you kind of retain all the layers, right? And you can back propagate all the way back up. But when, if you're doing mm -hmm. it, if you're doing like kind of temporal updates, T0, T1, things like that, it's not clear whether you're retaining, you're retaining the history and using it or you're just throwing it away. We don't, we don't use the history. I mean, you basically contain in that particular temporal Mm -hmm. state gotcha. yeah but you can you can definitely consider how to do it and retaining more information it's depending on how big your network you want to get to and whether you want to do recursively also mm -hmm. um and then we update on each node that would depend on all the edges of, at that point and you'd be like okay this actually looks very familiar if you do any physics or newtonian mechanics really this is actually how a network looks like it's very simple um, the graph network, when you have a bunch of nodes, these are input state, a lot of nodes, right? And these are like particles. 
and you have pairs of nodes, these are like two interacting particles. This analogy just to give you a sense why the physical prior is very interesting and important here. And the edge model here, you can imagine and compute the forces. It doesn't have to, but it ends up actually being the forces. When you sum pool all these messages, as you say earlier, we say earlier that you compute what's happening for the node, you pull all these messages together, it's kind of like summing the net force into this particular particle. Concatenate with the node, and then you basically you compute the next time step. When the no model, you realize, oh, there is a mass quality quantity, which can be known or unknown for the particle, depending on the system. And then you can calculate acceleration and compute next time step. So all this stuff is fairly simple. It's a bunch of NLPs, really. And so then what do I do? So let's see the outcome first. This is the truth on the left and the model on the right. It's a chaotic system, they're multi-body. So it looks okay, it's a thousand step rollout. It's not perfect, you'll see very soon, but I think it's quite okay given how long the rollout is actually. When I say rollout, it means we only train a one time step. The output is used as input for the next time steps. So any error from the output for this step will propagate forward as it goes, okay? So that is a very chaotic system if it's anything is incorrect. And here are the thousand steps row out for the truth on top and the bottom is the prediction. The M body system actually works pretty well. The balls bouncing four walls are actually really hard. Like any small, tiny changes, depending because of the error of the network actually propagates very significantly. The string, um, the spring onto a mass actually works quite well. And we also do the zero shot generalizations to larger systems where the network has not seen such many bodies, for example. So in M body system, it hasn't seen so many planets, it hasn't seen that many balls, it hasn't seen such a long string. And it seems to still work quite well. This is a thousand step rollout. So as you can see at the end, it's not as good, but at the beginning it's actually doing quite well. So we said, okay, at this point, can we figure out what the network has learned? and that it has compressed the information enough to make these predictions more or less correctly for a significant number of steps. So let's see that. So what we end up doing is that we want to encourage this low dimensionality representation in the graph network before we can extract to this symbolic equation. And how do we do that? Um, it's surprisingly, well, I shouldn't say, it's originally we thought it's surprisingly simple, but it's actually not as simple as we think as we apply this to other data sets. For this particular data set, we recorded the messages in this edge function, right? And we just simply apply L1 regularization. You should try many different regularization methods and realize that applying L1 regularization already makes it very, very um, sparse on the message factor. And once you have such a sparse factor, you can just interpret it, you throw it into the symbolic regression package and just try to find the forces. And what happened is that you find, we basically found rotation of the true force where there's two elements in it. That's actually very, um, very prominent. And then you find those two elements basically constitute a rotation of the true force. Um, let me give you a little bit more information because the input simulation I show you is 2D. We at first try to, you know, try to say, let's just fix it to 2D. And so there should be only two edge element that is important. But then once we limit to two, it makes the training much longer, the performance not as good. So then we use L1 regularization and minimize the number of message elements that are important to the fit that fits the observables to the predictions. And then we put this edge element through and then we can see that it actually works very well. We recover the Spring's law in 2D and also one of our square law in 3D in addition to the one of our square law in 2D. So we were fairly happy, but then we decided to do something a little harder because you know the stuff we showed you earlier, we know the answer. This stuff that I'm going to show, we don't know the answer at all. So remember we show you the simulations. Oh yeah, that's about 2.7 billion years ago. I mean, at, from, since the Big Bang of the universe, sorry. And the blue dots are actually the dark matter simulations. And this, this is an explosion of supernova um, of a star that became a supernova. It's interacting with the surrounding. It's probably plotting gas temperature right now of this movie um, of the universe. So 
given such a complex simulation, can we learn some unknown relationship among these components? So that's what we were thinking. So we settled on one challenge that we don't know the answer to. What is the density of dark matter within the center of dark matter halos, given the surrounding halo? So halo is basically just mean like a metropolitan city of galaxies. You can think of it this way, just a lot of galaxies together. And, but no one knows what is the density of this like center of the dark matter halo. Just like imagining, no one knows why. Maybe people do know, like imagining these like New York City type of galaxies. And we want to figure out how many people are there in the middle of this, in the center of this city of galaxies. So we can make guesses what this answer may be like, but we do not know this analytical formula from previous work. So we were like, okay, let's try to do this. Um, before I move on to the answer, I'm curious if people have any questions. There is a question, a general question from, uh, yeah. from Jorge. Uh, he says, my daughter asked me a few days about the dwarf planets in the solar system and the case of Pluto. And uh, he's wondering if these techniques can help us to, to discover uh, such bodies in, I guess it's, yeah. it's said in other systems, but even in our own system, I guess. Yeah, so actually at the end of my talk, if I get there, um, we'll actually talk about um, a work that we did with real data in NASA data that we tracks all the orbital uh, components about three, 31 moons and planets. And we were able to recover, and as you were saying, the unknown mass of the planets because we didn't know the mass of planets. And also we were trying to look for the planet nine, but we didn't find it. <laughs> so that's the equivalent of that. Um, so I guess I'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, Ryan, who's actually working with me in my group. Uh, he says, uh, what happens to the neural network if it's run on a problem described by PDEs without an analytic formula? That's a perfect question. I'm actually going to also touch on this. We are looking into interpreting and finding so closure relationship for turbulence, which are basically, you know, evolving a bunch of PDEs in a simulation. And we're trying to figure out how to A, recover the PDEs that you put in, B, extra terms in the simulations that you find that are sort of averages over different things. So that, that will be extremely interesting if you want to apply this to other methods. But that's very much uh, aligned with what we're thinking about doing. Um, we'll keep going since it's a rich question time. Uh, Daniel is saying, how would you judge the usefulness of this technique if you don't know the answer to the problem? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I, I actually myself think of it as a way to guide the theorists to you know instead of searching this huge huge range of equations you have a guide to say here there are a few relationships that you might want to take a look instead of like a million equations actually it's an infinite search space then you can actually boil down to a few equations so i think usefulness is still dependent on who you're collaborating with i think having scientists on board to basically interpret whether these found equations are useful i'm actually going to touch on this because I'm myself a, a cosmologist, and the equations we found here, we don't know the answer yet. <laughs> and there's one more question for me, Yvonne. Is the neural network just an n-order approximated solution of the PDEs? Hmm, I guess depending how you apply it, because I think people, a lot of them are not solving PDEs, right? So <laughs> for particular simulation accelerations, you can think of it as it's approximating these PDE solutions. But then there are situations where you know you apply neural network to situations they're not even that doesn't even have the differential equations available, right? So then you can use the neural network to sort of condense and do a dimensional reduction to the point that it's making some useful analysis, I guess. So that might not be even PDEs in that case. But that that's a good that's good analogy for the things that you apply to PDE simulations. I had a quick question about your edge forces too. Are they scalars or are they vectors? I mean, if they're pair, if it's like a pair, pair interaction, the direction of the force is between the two objects at each end of the pair, right? And then you're using superposition to get the many body response. Mm -hmm. So you're not, each edge is actually a scalar. It's not a vector. It is, um, we actually have to do it so separately. We have both information in. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. Good. But let me finish parts yep. of this because I think there's many good questions related to the next parts of the talks. Um, okay, so we try to take these dark matter simulations and simulations really and try to predict basically the center of the dark matter halo density. And we actually found new analytical formula that fit the observable better than what we can fit using sort of physical intuition. Like as a cosmologist, I want to guess what it is. These are like the old, old means things we try very hard to come up with and the error bar, and you can see that, you know, with mass, which is what we're allowing the system to do, it's actually doing a lot better. It has an equation that we don't really expect. And we thought, that's cool. We found a new equation that we still don't understand. Um, we're trying to work with theorists who do this specific type of uh, analysis to figure out why this is useful. So we found something that fits much better. And the question is why? And I think the the pathway to understanding is not yet there, but the pathway to some kind of analytical relationship is there. So that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so moving on to more complex relationships and simulations and situations. Here is a 3D compressible decaying turbulence, very low resolution just because of training. Um, we're showing the ground truth here, um, density, velocity, X, Y, Z, and pressure. And we're also looking at these other 3D mixing layer turbulence with radiative the cooling. So this is work that's recently published in Night Clear, uh, led by um, Kimberly Stetchenfield and people in outside German Fielding. And also I will talk about the sparsity in your network workshop part two. So first of all, we need a network that protects these complex simulations very well. Can we do that? On top is the ground truth. On the bottom is the predicted rollout. And let's hope it works, yes. And you can see that you know, qualitatively it's working fairly well. I can actually show you the spectral components, basically the power spectrum analysis also works fairly well. It, we have compared to all the current benchmark and realizing that actually it's very simple dilated residual neural net does basically better, slightly better than all the other methods out there um, with all the physical priors or whatever. And so, and then we also were showing it for these 3D compressible turbulence mixing layers for ground truth and the predicted rollout. But what's more than this is that, you know, apart from just using this network to predict things and making it faster or possibly going from low resolution to high resolution, we wanted to actually, I'm gonna skip over this because of time. This is just showing like different resolution. We want to go to predict these equations, actually find the equations in, in these simulations. Because at this point we know this simple equations we can do, how about very complex simulations with very complex equations, right? So can we do that? So we call what we did the before, we did the stuff that we just saw before. We took a graph network, we basically try to do L1 regularization on the edge factor, and then we regress on these small number of elements. What we found out is that that method actually doesn't work entirely on this new data set because of complexity of the equations. And we came up with a new sort of like new way of doing multilayer perceptron. We call this entangled sparsity network, where you basically encourage each output feature to depend on as few input features as possible. And that actually helps a lot. And I'll show you what that means. Here we're showing um, on the um, y-axis the sort of the input feature. These are the sort of like the latent parameters in the edge factor. You can think of it this way. And you can see that these output parameters, we can see that when you train, once you do this um, disentangles sparsity network, it will push us it to have each of these edge, these elements to depend on as few inputs as possible. So these are like, you know, velocities and density, sorry for the, the plotting. And you can say slowly incur, it went to like a steady state. And once we have this, we can plug it into the symbolic regression package that we developed and we extracted this formula using um, PISER, this package that we should be publishing soon. It's actually publicly available, by the way. Um, I can show you guys what it is. And the true fluid equations on the left, it's not completely perfect. We're still working on it. We actually have recently implemented something new to this and it's now working in the sense that it has recovered the correct equation. But when it was published in 2021, it's missing some of these elements. Um, like pressure and density were very similar for some of these uh, training data sets. And you realize that you actually picked it up. And sometimes it's not entirely correct. So we're working on it to make it better. And I think it's getting there right now. 
So we were fairly happy to realize that we can do more complex equations on, and not to mention there are closure relationships here that will be extra terms that we should be expecting to. So how about using some real data, right? We mentioned about the planets earlier. We have these horizons ephemeris data, this orbits of all the planets and moons, about 31 of them for 30 years. So we took real data set this time and we did the whole thing again, except we added extra elements to it, which I won't have time to describe, unfortunately. And we recovered the Newton's law and we learned the unknown masses of both the planets and the moons. And I'll show you how well it worked. Here are the positions. And you can see on the left is the data from the bodies of the inner solar system. On the right is the same bodies evolved from the same initial condition using the learned interaction, doing the rollout you saw before, step by step. So that network is only doing per step prediction. It was able to roll out for like five years out of 30 years, actually probably 10 years out of like 30 years they set. So we were pretty happy. And then we also did show, okay, let's hold it holds. Um, that, oh, showing you the movie already, um, the masses of, the, of different planets and moons, these are all the planets and all the moons. The truth is a star. Um, the predicted is the, the circle here. And you can see that they're basically on top of each other, except for the very light moons or the very light planet of the system. What do I mean by that is that the gravitational influence, if it's very small gravitational influence, you should expect there's a larger error to it. So as long as that moon has a very little influence on the whole system, of course, you don't see any perturb perturbative um, effect on the whole system, then you actually have a larger error, which is what we expect, which we'll show here. So we were quite happy because we realized that we were able to take a bunch of data, real data from actual sky, for 30 years, take 20 years of it to train actually some parts of it for validation. And then you can predict what happened next for the next 10 years. You extract the equation from it. And on top of that, we are able to learn the masses extremely well. And here's a movie that I would like to show you guys if it runs. I'm going to show you just the last part of it because the sake of time, it would be a lot of work if I run the whole thing. So we showed three different methods. We actually improved on what we had done in 2020 uh, in the NERFS paper. Um, here showing the true and the predicted. True is the smashed one. And you can see that it retained a fairly good orbit for quite a number of years for the inner solar system. And if you only use a neural net, I can show that earlier, it actually doesn't work as well. So conclusion. There has been a dramatic adoption of like deep learning in astrophysics community in the past couple of years. And I'm actually very happy about this. There comes also a significant pushback to this, like I call it technical debt. We accumulate as we use tools and not completely understood you know, by anyone. So we demonstrate it's possible to move towards a more interpretable machine learning methods for the science. And we can understand a bit of the network if you're able to sparsify it. So not all network works, I think. So the number of latent parameters to interpret is relatively small using symbolic regression. There are a lot of improvements we can do with symbolic regression side and also how to sparsify network. Was physical prior or not with physical prior? You know, there's a whole world of pruning. Um, the formula recovered from the network can guide us in understanding both the network and the system we model. As a scientist, I find it very intriguing is that even for physical laws, we don't know the answer to. For that cosmological example, we can observe a system and let machine learning sort of guide us to find analytical expression that may be guiding us to further understanding. And that I find the most exciting myself as a scientist, but I can see how the computer scientists would be very excited about sort of understanding what the network is doing as well. And I'll pause here for questions and thank you so much for listening. So th <clears throat> thanks so much, Shelley. Really stimulating talk, wonderful. Let's open it up for uh, general questions. We've had some great questions. Uh, there's a sociological question. Is Flatiron Institute where you do all your research? Mostly, yes. I mean, I also, I guess, work at home these days. Everyone works from home at some time <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> Are there more questions? If you'd like to unmute yourself and speak, you're welcome to do so also. 
I had a I had a question actually about this this last one. Um, so did you uh, recover? Uh, I mean, obviously the gravity is an inverse square law, right? Um, how many decimal places did you get it the it to be an inverse square law? I mean, what's I don't, honestly don't remember. I need to check. This is a good question. What's the error bar, right? So that's one thing we were thinking about doing is to make these predictions probabilistic by right? giving an error bar out of the whole thing. We have not done it, but that will be a really good next step. And uh, one of my summer students is supposed to do it. We don't know what is going to happen. Um, I one thing I should yeah. warn you is that there is an error bar that's quite significant because we know GR is the correct law and we did not recover GR. And we actually tried to look for it. Um, but it turns out that GR's effect is actually, general relativity effect is very small compared to even tidal effects of planets on each other. So the effect of say Jupiter on a moon is actually larger than the GR effect. So it's just so small, we cannot, cannot pull it up. Does NASA have any data on things like circling neutron stars or something like that? Because you might, it might yeah. become more important in that case, right? We have uh, one of our flat and fellow uh, that's jointly advised by the gravitational waves group, you know, these black holes merging. And our group in data science, they he actually applies a lot of these machine learning techniques in um, understanding merging black holes. So just definitely invite him to talk about that direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's more questions from Louis Philippe again. Would flat time be interested in using computational power for renders and testing? If yes, where can I reach out? So that's a, a kind of collaborative thing. Then funny question, will the results of these models in your research allow us to know if there's diamond rain on Neptune? Hmm, I haven't thought about diamond rain on Neptune. Um, I guess I just don't have the data on it yet. Like, do we have any observations? In the end, as a scientist, we need the data. I mean, we need theory, but we also need data. Um, for the collaborative part, I mean, feel free to email me. I'm, I'm totally Googleable online. So we can talk more about it offline too. And there's a the last little question. Could Planet Nine be a very small black hole? Mm -hmm. It could be. Um, there's a lot of searches in, um, originally there's something called, um, people let you talk about dark matter clumps in our system. It could be like a dark matter clump, like a clump of matter. It could be a black hole. It could be a very small black hole. It's, there's many, many theories about what it could be, but no one knows if it exists yet. Okay, more questions. Uh, there's one from Timothy Liu. He's a former group member. Uh, do you think the recovery of an appropriate model depends heavily on the architecture of your network? Do you have a rough idea on the dimension of your latent factor before building up your neural network model? Yeah, so I, I mean, for the force laws, as a scientist, you kind of know the dimension and you kind of know how many factors you need. So I think that somewhat depends on the, on the physical prior you put into the, to the model. Um, on the other hand, because we just use L1 regularization, we're not fixing it to like two, right? As I mentioned, when you fix it to two, because I think of noise, you can't actually do it as well. So if somehow I messed up the data and thought it was two dimensional, but it's actually three dimensional, I suspect it will actually tell you it's three dimensional. So that's a more concrete example. But broadly speaking, I think if you design your model following the physical prior as much as you can, you would need less data to train. It would be more interpretable because it's a much simpler network usually. Um, I think uh, Aaron, Aaron has uh, his hand up. You want to I, unmute, unmute yeah. yourself? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I just have a really quick question, which is, are there instances where using machine learning to try to model astronomical phenomenon produce impossible equations so that you get basically a result from your, your derived equations uh, from your machine learning system that basically say, oh, we know that that equation can't po be possible. Therefore, we can say the thing we started with probably isn't possible either. So like to use uh, the possibility, right? And go backwards yeah. and say, well, now yeah. we can rule out certain things. We have not done this, actually. This is a good idea. Um, I mean, you're basically using machine learning to like 
basically look at a system and find impossible equations and realize, okay, it has to be wrong, basically the data itself, which is cool. I, we have not done it. It's a paper to write. Thank you very much. So there's a, there's a great question in the, uh, in the chat from Umer. So again, sociological, so fascinating work. The ability to derive analytical models that enhance the understanding of existing physical laws or point to new ones using GNNs, sparsity, disentanglement, and symbolic regression. So summary of your talk there. Nice, thank you. Um, here's the question. Uh, do you think this approach will be accepted in the scientific community as a legitimate approach to discover new physical models? I think it really depends. It's probably a function of time, right? So like I started doing this about sort of like learning what deep learning 2012 2013 and at that time when i mentioned anything about this people would just laugh me out of the room like as a junior faculty to this all that addition stuff and i remember 2015 before the work um i would give a talk and my friends and the audience would say oh yeah these people are using black boxes to understand basically dark matter of the universe which no one knows what it is so it's impossible but i think slowly there are more and more adoption and people you know the work got better but I think now we also face a situation where there's a lot more noise with more people doing it. Noise in the sense that people applying it, just taking a hammer and hammering anything they can come up with. So that adoption part will be a sociological experiment. We'll see how it rolls out. I think if the network model gives you an equation that you would then take it and work with theorists, I think people would actually be pretty excited about it. Um, there is an example in oceanography where I think Laura Sana's work, if you want to look it up, they took very simple deep learning, but I think very powerful deep learning methods um, to model the closure relations in ocean of the earth. So just take low resolution to high resolution, they train it with something like a unit, and they, instead of using unit, they try to do something like symbolic regression, but not symbolic regression. So they have a data bank of equations. They do it semi automatically so they still need a lot of handpicking. And then they found these equations that they can plug into the low resolution simulation they're going to run to basically include subgrid modeling of the high resolution components, right? That they were missing when they run the low resolution simulation. And that's been adopted fairly well in oceanography because you can't model the entire ocean on multi-scale large ocean of the whole earth over many, many millions of years because they want to do climate research. So that has been adopted and they are looking into how to take into these closure relations and modeling forward. I think there are adoptions to it, but maybe a new physical model that's completely opposite to what we think is true, that might be harder. How easy is it to put in constraints that are coming from things like uh, conservation laws and continuity equations, things like this? Is that straightforward or is it really difficult? For the depends on the network. For the network that we have, we can actually do it fairly easily. I actually cited Lagrange neural network and Hamiltonian neural network at some point in the talk, where basically instead of predicting the actual positions and coordinates of the system, you're actually predicting the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian itself. So you can actually put in all these constraints as you see fit. For the graph network that we show, the interaction network, there's a global variable that you can just apply and say, I want it constant energy or momentum or is having a single source term, however you like. That's fairly easy, I think. If you predicting the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian, do you have to then solve it to get the result? Like you just- mm -hmm. or... Just so... pick derivatives, yeah. Yeah. Okay, very nice. So are there any more? It's already a um, little after 12, but if there is any more questions, I'm sure Shirley will take it. You can also email me. I can be found very easily on Twitter or in real person. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> so let's let's wrap up then. Thank the audience for uh, coming and the great interaction. And most of all, of course, thank you, Shirley, for your time and your wonderful work. It's really a pleasure. And uh, I'll definitely be following up with you. I mean, we've been talking for a while, so yeah. We should definitely chat regardless. And I'd love to see you guys in person at some point. That sounds good.
Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your wonderful and insightful questions. We should all be writing papers, maybe with us. Maybe not. <laughs> this all side right, of so the least. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have Bye. a great day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.